Okay, uh, welcome back everybody. So uh, next up we have uh, Team Voyager who is going to give a 50 minute talk and then another 10 minute question for you to the uh, Go ahead. Um, okay, well good afternoon. Thank you very much for being here. I know there are some very, um, very important people here so we really appreciate your time. Um, time is money, you get that. Um, I would like to introduce <laughs> Oasis. Um, this is the new mission. Um, Orbiting asteroid for strategic in situ supplies. Um, so we are going to be locating ourselves on this lovely <coughs> oasis. Mojito in hand, of course. Um, and we are Team Voyager this year. So next, please. Um, so just a little bit about our team to start off with. Um, this is us, and we're really awesome. 16 <laughs> team members. Um, Really interestingly, I thought it would be great to look at um, the build-up of our team. So 10 engineers, materials, plant, tree, math, um, an architect, and two physics people. So really technical. Um, so we're actually a really constant group of people to do a mission like this and kind of push the envelope of um, design. Um, and really diverse as well, as you can see, an architect, and math, and science, and engineering. So hopefully you'll see um, the product of that diversity come out through our presentation. So I know you've already seen this, but just to remind you, what is the problem that we're trying to deal with? Um, assuming in 2024 that the asteroid redirect mission successfully turns these um, different criteria, so 500 metric tons, C type asteroid, the type of the asteroid is important, which we'll see later, um, to a DRO with a mean radius of 5 days, which is important to remember as we go through this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Keyword <laughs> challenge <laughs> to design a mission to take a human to land um, on an asteroid. Um, and key dates 2028, so our, our constraint um, timelines are between 2024 and 2028. Next. Um, so we just talked about the asteroid redirect mission. Um, where is that in terms of NASA's Goal and why are we looking at a picture of Mars right now? So NASA's flight full path, um, it's NASA's strategic long-term plan for human space exploration and it's a way that steadily advances technological development between here and Mars. Um, the ARM, um, the redirect mission that we've already seen, um, and Mars, the OASIS mission kind of is an intermediate stepping stone between the two. So as someone mentioned earlier, um, what happens if Mars is no longer our, our destination? And this is a very possible um, situation that we could be in because of the um, political um, light and the way in which NASA operates within the government. So um, the flexible path allows um, technology to keep developing in the direction of a long-term human space flight. Um, regardless of the final destination. And Oasis um, fits within that, um, again, regardless of the destination. Um, okay, so why this mission? There are so many cool things we could do in space. It's really big and dangerous and crazy. Um, these are all the reasons that we've kind of come up with, but the main one, um, this mission will guide the utilization of resources for future space exploration. So basically, again, go back to the flexible path. We're going to use this mission as a way of preparing ourselves for a longer term space flight. And why send humans? It seems a bit crazy. Why not do something along the lines of robotics? It's cheaper, um, less risk. NASA is pretty risk adverse. And again, the outcome of this mission will guide the future manned mission to Mars. There is no analog mission on Earth that will quite represent what OASIS will do. Um, not to the same extent and will not prepare the astronauts. Um, so some key assumptions before we even start looking at our requirements, um, what, what do we already know? So um, in, in addition to the problem statement, um, we already have delivery of DRO by the redirect mission. Um, there exists a docking mechanism to attach to ERA, so we are going to be using that. Um, we are going to be using the power from that, and we're going to say that astronauts have access to the asteroid surface. The asteroid is stable, it has been despun, and importantly, a low fidelity characterization um, has been complete. So we already know um, from ARM about the probes that were used to <coughs> capture it um, from topological um, characteristics of the asteroid. Communication, 
between asteroids during EVA is possible through um, all operations, and um, the SOS Box 1B is currently available. Um, and here we go. Um, what is our mission statement? Demonstrating the capa um, capability for humans to live and work independently in deep space through the creation of a long-term platform, um, in situ resource utilization of an asteroid. The main terms here, working independently, long-term platform, an asteroid. So thank you. Let's look at some of our objectives. Um, we're going to look at science, technological, and human factor objectives. Our primary science objectives are to characterize the interior surface and the composition of the asteroid. It is to understand the space environment around the asteroid, and it is to extract, process, and demonstrate the use of the resources. Our secondary science objectives are to understand the origins of the solar system and also to demonstrate planetary defense and contamination protection. Um, our primary technological objectives are to develop a platform for deep space exploration. It is to reach a lunar distant retrograde orbit with manned missions and return the crew successfully um, back to Earth. It's to demonstrate the ability of crew to survive in deep space environment for long duration of the mission. Some of the human factors objectives that we're considering during this mission are to demonstrate the ability of the crew to perform EVA uh, with, limited, with simulated limited communication delays. It is to record some of the physiological and psychological effects on the crew and compare that with the ISS data, uh, and also to demonstrate capability of the spacesuit designs for exploring a new terrain. So think of this platform as uh, an oasis our vision here is that um, the asteroid is going to be here. This is the asteroid redirect robotic vehicle, which we assume that has successfully been brought back. And this is our system, the platform that we're developing. Um, so this is the multi-purpose docking module. This is the Orion module, the habitat, and this is the propulsion module. So this whole system acts as a, acts as a platform for future um, space exploration. It is going to be there for longer duration to do more experiments um, ahead of just the one mission that we are presenting here. And also we are going to demonstrate the use of, um, the ISRU part of it is to use the resources from the asteroid um, to sustain longer uh, duration space flight. So it's demonstrating living off the land. To give you a quick overview of the mission, in the next 40 minutes you'll be looking at um, how the science payload would be used to survey the asteroid for structural integrity, for environmental safety for the astronauts, and also to determine the composition and the structure. <coughs> the astronauts will perform seven EVAs. The first six would be for our ISRU, and the last one would be to demonstrate independent decision making. Some of the operations that you will be looking at would be um, using um, seismic monitoring module, a subsurface drill composition analysis unit to characterize the structure and composition, um, we will be using a space environment monitoring module to characterize the space environment and a resource utilization module um, for extracting, processing, and demonstrating the use of resources. On the human factors side, um, we would be recording the radiation data, health data, and mood data. And also we would be performing short duration EVAs with the habitat. We call it the Labitat because it's the lab plus the habitat. Um, and that would act as our mission control. Uh, and we would simulate some um, communication delays. We would also uh, try to demonstrate independent decision making in that um, we will have a predetermined list of tasks and the asteroids would collect, um, the, the astronauts would collect asteroid samples and they would perform some experiments. Hello everyone. So we are assuming that our asteroid is going to be placed in a distant retrograde orbit, which is a family of periodic solutions to the fifth Earth world problem. So in here we are presenting a family, uh, members of this family, around the L1 and L2 points. And in particular, our nominal orbit has a mean radius of 6150 uh, 500 kilometers. And you can see here, this is the orbit uh, that we computed, because it's slightly smaller because of this mean radius that the actual values you may find in the reference. So we'll go into the dynamics of this system in a minute, but just to anticipate it, you can see here what happens with the long-term integration of this kind of orbit. Okay. Can you go 
of here. Uh, so we are dividing our payload into two launches. The first one is going to take the habitat, or the habitat as we're calling it, plus a propulsion module, plus auxiliary. And then we have a crew launch with the orient capsule plus a docking module. So for this, we are actually driven by the mass of these systems. So the cargo has a mass of 70 tons. And the delta V for inserting into a ballistic orbit, I'm anticipating this, we'll go into this in a minute. It's a roughly 3.1 kilometers, you can see it in optimized values. So for this, we can fit this into a Falcon Heavy uh, because of costs issues, we'll be using this, this launcher. Now the free mission using Orion will go for the SLS Block 1B that with a total mass, including the docking module of uh, roughly 34 tons, and we'll be sending it in, again, I'm anticipating this, into a flyby outbound trajectory to the moon that may take around 8.5 days. So anticipated, we'll be using ballistic trajectories. So in the references, we can find a lot of optimized values and studies of these things, but just to follow the spirit of the Garden Space Summit, we actually computed our own ballistic transfers that we can see here. And it was, well, it was a lot of fun, but <laughs> we plug in here the <laughs> our nominal DRO. We plug it into our propagator with the full JPL of Ameris, And ended up, well, after a run of Monte Carlo simulations, we ended up with a, this kind of candidate trajectory. You can see that you are close here in, the, uh, here in that one. So the main advantage of this kind of trajectory is that when you are inserted into them, you may need potentially no delta V, apart from some maybe 15 meters per second just to control the orbit. And we can just handle this with a bi-prop thrusters on the, on the habitat. Now, as for the crew mission, we can't afford such a long flight time, like 100 days. So we'll be looking to different transfer options. So again, in the references we have been seeing these days, they talk about uh, direct transfers and fly by outbound trajectory. But we also wanted to look to new, to explore new possibilities. So we considered also into our trade-off the free return trajectories to the moon. So if we fail this phase, we will go back to the Earth, just like kind of the initial Apollo trajectory. And unfortunately, the delta Vs for these trajectories is too high. So in the end, we stick to the reference values and went for a fly one one trajectory to the moon. So just once inserted into orbit, we'll perform a rendezvous maneuver just to achieve the final configuration of our spacecraft. And we'll cruise to the moon in 8.5 days. Now again, for the propulsion, we'll use Orion system plus additional delta V from the docking rendezvous module. So, so we are concerned once in the DRO, what happens with the abort scenarios? How can we go back to the Earth? So again, we computed for, okay, starting very close to L1, as we have all along the DRO. This is the kind of delta V you may need to go back to the Earth, depending on the type of trajectory. And this is the time of flight. So we are roughly looking at 180 to less than 200 hours, which makes roughly 8.5 days, nine days to go back to Earth, depending on which point of the DRO you are. <coughs> Next, please. So as for the launch windows, if we want to schedule our launches in this, in this mission, we are mainly driven for the cargo phase, for the sun moon lateral position, because we are working with the ballistic trajectories. So if we are going for exterior ballistic trajectories, we are interested in the position of the L1 Earth sound system. So basically we'll have, again, in the references, there are a lot of optimized values, so we may have like an optimal launch window every roughly one month. For the crew phase, we may be looking especially to the phasing at the DRO, to save delta V when inserting into the orbit. So given the, peri the period of the DRO, we may be looking to that kind of period before launch. We allocated these, um, these launch windows, seeing here the inclination of the moon. So we are launching our cargo on March 30. We'll arrive July 8. This basically comes from our simulations of the ballistic captures. We are launching our crew just a couple of months later, just to have time in case we need to delay our launch for the car. Finally, just a quick summary of the timelines. We have, of course, the main thing is the cargo transit to, to the ballistic orbit, roughly three months. Then we arrive, we launch the crew, arrive in eight days. We start the science operations to seven EVAs. Then we have a final experiments 
and after roughly 26 days in total, having the adequate casing, we head back to the air. Hi, uh, now we'll tell you about our mission architecture. We have five phases in our mission. The first phase is to launch the cargo uh, and put it into a uh, lunar uh, DRO, uh, into a parking lunar DRO, waiting for the crew to get there. In phase two, we have the crew launching on SLS Block 1B uh, that will go and dock on our station. And uh, after that, in phase three, we have the, uh, the habitat to join the modules uh, and dock to that. And in phase four, we have the nominal uh, EBA nominal operations of our uh, mission, and phase five is to return the crew back safely back to Earth. So I'm going to go mo more into detail of every phase. In phase one, we launch uh, our habitat module along with the propulsion module, and we uh, we put them into an orbit around the Earth, a uh, circular parking orbit, and we do a system check. If everything is good, we uh, we put it into a ballistic trajectory towards the moon. Once we have the final burn, we can inflate our habitation model. Uh, and once everything is normal again, we continue with the mission. Uh, the habitation model is inserted into a parking lunar distant retrograde orbit. And uh, it's going to wait there for the crew to arrive and, land, uh, to, and dock first to uh, our Oasis mission. Next. So in the phase two, we have the launch of our uh, Orion and multi-purpose docking module uh, on board of SLS Block 1B. Uh, they will be put into a uh, elliptical orbit, elliptical parking orbit around the Earth for a final system check before uh, having the final burn towards the, the moon. Uh, once, once the burn is performed, we can uh, do a transposition docking and extraction maneuver to dock the, uh, the service module to this, uh, the docking module. And this is a maneuver that's been already performed during the Apollo program, uh, so m multiple times successfully. Uh, so we don't see any uh, problem with that. Uh, finally, the, the modules are inserted into uh, a DRO, uh, and the, with the final system check, we can perform the docking with, uh, with ARM. So in phase three, we, uh, we do something pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, to, to make the docking simpler, we have uh, the Orion in this configuration uh, docked to the docking module, and that's how they dock to the AR. But to make way for the habitation model, we have to move the Orion uh, and put it on the bottom of the docking module. And how we do it is using the command arm X in the future uh, <laughs> to unberth uh, Orion. And, and birth it to the bottom side of the docking module. This way, we can uh, make sure everything is good and uh, open up this docking uh, location for the habitat. And we do a final check if everything is good. We can do the, uh, the final approach of the habitat and uh, do the final docking to the, the docking module. Next. Uh, phase four is uh, at the end of the last phase. If everything is uh, nominal, uh, we can start our nominal operations and go ahead with our uh, science experiments and our seven EVAs. Uh, we expect the mission to be around uh, 39 days uh, minimum. If everything goes right and if we get a lot of cool science results, we can extend the mission to three months. Next. Um, <coughs> and at the end of the, the fourth phase, we have, uh, and everything is good, we can bring the crew back to Earth. Uh, so we do, we undock the Orion from the bottom of the uh, docking module and put it into a trajectory towards Earth. Um, and finally, the phase five is finished uh, once the Orion capsule uh, has, has done a splashdown in the Pacific Ocean. Next. Okay, for our, uh, our science objectives here, uh, we're going to go through a quick little overview. Uh, really, it's threefold. The first thing is um, going to be encapsulated by this here and these two. First is to ensure the safety of the crew and equipment. I think this deserves uh, a second just to kind of appreciate that. Um, yes, we're assuming that we do have some information from the, uh, from the prior arm mission. However, um, we're not assuming that we want to actually send our astronauts out onto the asteroid with that information. We need to characterize this ourselves. So to do that, 
we're going to uh, look at drilling, sampling, and actually deploying a seismic survey uh, that can actually sound the, uh, the asteroid, can create a 3D geologic model, and uh, from that we're going to actually leave it on there and it's going to continue to monitor the asteroid as it, uh, as it evolves, as we begin to remove mass from it. We also need to characterize the space environment. So the radiation, uh, the plasma, um, whether there's potential for outgassing, and uh, dust concentrations. These are all important to characterize before we do any EVAs. Uh, following that, it's kind of a green light, red light situation, we can step into determining our composition. So we want to look at subsurface composition and uh, to, to take that, identify the resources. Now I really want to emphasize as well uh, the subsurface because there's a lot of talk about surface uh, information that people get from IR spectra, things like that, but we really don't know anything about the subsurface and that's hugely important. Um, so we're going to be looking at water content, the form of that water, whether it be ice, hydrated minerals, clay balance water, uh, chemical analysis, elemental analysis, that all feeds into identifying the resources. Once we know what those resources are, we can proceed into our ISRU, extracting, on a larger scale, processing, and then demonstrating uh, utilization of those. So the ISRU here is going to be uh, a deep drill with a five meter uh, total depth capability, as well as sampling uh, within the upper one meter. So no sampling below that. Uh, it's going to leave a borehole that we can do borehole logging in, and I'm gonna go through that, uh, as well as a resource utilization demonstrator, which is going to be a single package that's actually going to uh, give us everything that we need in terms of processing, and then uh, um, actually showing what results we'll get from that, what sort of uh, resources. Next, please. So here's a bit of an operations overview. Uh, we're going to start by not assuming that we can actually access this, uh, that it's the bay. We have uh, put in a couple of days to be able to prepare access to the surface, whether that be cutting the bay or not. Now that was relevant only for option A. We know about option B. However, um, it's there and we can use it. Uh, following that, we want to go to our preliminary robotic survey. Okay, so we don't want the astronauts out there yet. We need to place, uh, using the Canada Army, a couple of different modules that we can do uh, very, very shallow drilling, and we can put our uh, surface uh, seismic monitor, as well as our space environment characterization monitor, uh, there to be able to give the green light or the red light to the crew. Following the green light, we're gonna proceed into our deep drilling. Again, five meters total, uh, sampling from the upper one meter. Uh, core samples, as I mentioned, and then we're going to uh, look at extending that seismic deployment to, to actually have a fairly high resolution uh, seismic analysis. That's gonna give us some really, really good information on the interior structure. Coupling that with the deep drilling so that we know not only what the seismic character is, but how to tie that back to what the geologic character is. Um, after we're able to do that, we're going to continue with uh, four more EVAs that are going to be require, uh, required to get the majority of our core samples back. Uh, and then the final one is going to be the simulated communications delay, which is hopefully intended to represent um, this independent thinking and the idea that uh, we need to address this if we're ever going to go on longer term missions. Next slide, please. So here's a quick schematic of our subsurface drill composition analysis unit. Um, you can see it right here. This looks like a, a lot like a uh, oil and gas drill because that's what it is. However, <laughs> we can, you know, we have pictures of other things, uh, <laughs> but this one was sort of the schematic that we wanted to go with. Now, we would likely go with something done by Honeybee Robotics. Um, they've been working a lot with uh, the planetary uh, groups, and uh, they've got some really cool stuff. So. Uh, just to start at the bottom here, we have a drill bit. That's not what the drill bit will look like, but uh, we can actually have a core barrel in here. We want to have monitors above weight on bit and power monitors. This gives us uh, information on the unconfined compressive strength of the material. And so that'll give us an idea whether it's, uh, whether the integrity of the interior of this asteroid is. Um, above that, we have an XRF. XRF is going to give us detailed elemental analysis. Again, this feeds back into what are the resources. We have an IR spectrometer that's going to give us more chemical analysis as well as the form of the water. So we need to understand whether it's in a hydrated mineral, whether it's clay bound water, uh, or whether it's in there as pure water ice. This completely determines the extraction method. Um, up top here we have the gamma ray spectrometer uh, coupled with a neutron spectrometer. This is going to give us lithology 
as well as uh, the water content in uh, percent mass hydrogen. So uh, here what we have is a schematic of the borehole and the actual gamma ray and neutron spec can be done continuously. So this is kind of an example of what that could look like. The X-ray uh, fluorescence and the near IR spectrometer are going to be point samples. So they'll be done at every, say, five centimeters or so uh, of the borehole. Next slide, please. The seismic monitoring module, again, here's an example of a seismometer. This is going to be coupled to the surface and an example of what the seismic uh, uh, result might look like. Uh, the array is going to give us this detailed 3D geophysical image. You couple that back to the um, actual compositional analysis that's done by these deep drills, and you can come up with a very well-constrained 3D geologic model. The big thing here is that we want continuous monitoring of this. We don't want to stop it, say we've done it once, and that's it. As you remove mass from this, as you involve yourself and manipulate this asteroid, it's going to potentially move, potentially shift, this can serve as, a, uh, as an alarm system uh, for our crew and the equipment to be able to get safely away from this if something is happening. So this has been around for a while called microseismic monitoring. It's a <coughs> passive system. So we have an active system that we can use once, a passive system that we can uh, just leave there to continuously monitor. Next, please. In addition to the interior, I talked about the exterior. We need to characterize the space environment and, again, continuously characterize the space environment. So we have a surface dust impact monitor that's going to provide dust velocity, mass measuring, again, constantly so that every EVA is a green light, red light. Um, we have a surface radiation access detector looking at galactic cosmic rays and solar energetic particles. And finally, magnetometer and plasma monitor so that we understand the local magnetic field, the interaction between that and the solar wind, and, uh, and the uh, plasma situation as well. Next, please. And finally, the resource utilization demonstrator mo module. This is a, a, a custom module that's going to be built using previously existing technology that's all exists. But the idea is to integrate it all into one module that is all very sealed and separate so that there's no contamination issues. Um, the idea behind it is to take our uh, asteroid material, place it into this, use pyrolysis initially, um, to separate out volatiles and refractories. Uh, the refractories can be used for looking at solar uh, radiation and thermal shielding, things like that. We then want to move into uh, using distillation processes to extract water. Uh, we want to look at electrolysis then, which is going to separate hydrogen and oxygen. And finally, a uh, reverse water gas shift to create methanol. So this is going to be our propellant. So from this we have water, we have hydrogen, we have oxygen, and we have methanol as a propellant. Next. As you can see, we are, we are proposing two launches, one with the Falcon Heavy and the other one with the Specialist Block 1B. So this is the mass distribution for like each of the launches. You can, since, as you can see, Orion almost like takes up up to 50% of the available mass on both the launches. So we are like going for the Orion and docking module together as described in the mission architecture together on the uh, SLS block one. The habitat is going on the Falcon Heavy. Next. So as you can see here, like the main docking, this is a docking module where like almost like five fourths of it are like completely done with the uh, equipment that we are going to send. On one side we have the R, on one side we have the, uh, the uh, asteroid direct mission, and on the other side we have the Canada R. On one side we have, uh, so we, what we are trying to see is that like, we want to align the habitat along on the uh, axial port available so that the extension of the, uh, for the future expansion, it's possible to dock other like ports, so, um, to dock other stations over here. And this is my Orion capsule. These are my solar panels. So as you can see, the amount of like solar um, and uh, like power that's generated on the arm is roughly about like 41 kilowatts. And our like, peak power requirement is like 46 to 47 kilowatts. So for that, we are going for an additional Solar, uh, solar panel arrays on the propulsion module as well. Apart from this, my propulsion module also houses my required uh, GNC and the heat exchangers. And now why, like, why this propulsion module is very important? Because, because I'm launching my habitat module separately from the Orion uh, capsule. So which means that it needs a guide, uh, it needs a proper like, put a propulsion module to ensure that it's put into the orbit and then it's docking safely. Uh, apart from that, 
it needs to also take care of my patient's like housekeeping, and that which is very important considering the fact that my uh, almost like my heart has traveled for like 100 days. Next, so we do propose an active heating system with the radiator, and for the current system, uh, in the event of any like extreme solar event, so we want to ensure that like the active uh, heating systems for the like, to ensure that the temperature is maintained. And apart from that, we like for this mission, we propose an open loop eclipse system because. Uh, from what we found out is that like, if we have an open loop, open loop eclipse system for the future missions, it will be easier for us to like, go there, like, recharge, and then go for any deep space missions. And then this can act as a like, station, midway station where like, I can go, like, uh, do whatever I want like, over there or like, uh, dock there for like, if there is any event that's happening which is not in favor of humans, and then we can like, stay there for some time and then go. So, and one more thing that we have found out is that the inflatable, mo the inflatable habitat provides like, uh, from the NASA specifications and which is also being developed by, this, uh, uh, which is uh, in the process of being developed on, or the, in the future it's going to be test flight, is the Bigelow Aerospace Inflatable Module, which is, which provides a better improved like impact protection over aluminum. And in, in another sense, it also reduces, to a certain extent, it also reduces my mass because aluminum is comparatively very heavy. And uh, in the event of any like large radiation event, like coronal mass ejection, uh, my uh, our, like uh, my core like the uh, is about 15 centimeters thickness, and which is enough to meet the NASA <coughs> exposure standard. We have calculated the exposure timings and the radiation dosage, uh, radiation dose data from the available NASA handbooks, which are like for the Apollo, for the ISS. So from that, what we have like we got we came to the conclusion that it like uh, we we are like well within the standards of the exposure limit, and like my eclipse storage systems and consumables are like about, uh, they weigh about like 1.3 metric ton, and especially the power is also very important, and uh, all of us, like all of these figures are like, they're, they're, they're quantified figures with, with the help of the references that are shown here. Next. <coughs> so. The previous slides showed the technical specifications required to make life exist at this asteroid. And this shows the integrated design. For the scope of our mission, it's not enough to use the Orion's capability to fly with the asteroid for only four days. The habitat is required to perform the rigorous, extensive scientific survey we have planned. We envision this not just as a habitat for this mission. Basically, the question was, why send a crew at all? Why can't we just look at this with the robotic explorers? Is it just an excuse to get uh, Orion to fly around the moon to use people to for a PR stunt for NASA? And we think this is a firm no. <laughs> we envision this habitat as a stepping stone directly applicable to humans' ability to survive, and not just simply survive, but thrive with a proper home and workshop away from Earth. The name Labitat reflects its dual purpose. It is a lab and a habitat. It is meant to be a functional workspace to provide not just work, but living and the human experience for these crew members. We derived this from a Bigelow BA-330, but made some extensive modifications for ergonomic reasons. The central rig rigid core provides backbone both functionally and structurally for this module. A central tunnel connects, allows access between the node and the rest of the module, and there are other tunnels at right angles to it which serve as uh, access from one side of the ship to the other. They serve as sleeping nooks for the location of beds during night, and they have radiation storage. This core contains the, the additional radiation protection necessary in the event of a coronal mass ejection. Uh, next. This habitat is designed with use in mind. These voids in the structure allow for storage and for the location of scientific racks. By utilizing microgravity, we can use this as a 360 degree axis to all points of this toroid, allowing for a very unique uh, paradigm shifting use of space as opposed to the square racks and hallway configuration of ISS modules. This is to maximize our limited volume resources. Um, in addition to using this to maximize our volume, we did show that the inflatable was more useful because it had a greater mass to volume ratio. Here you can see the color-coded uh, locations for different storage devices. 
So to inhabit this uh, fantastic habitat that we designed, we have a crew of three astronauts. <coughs> the EVAs will require two astronauts with another running the Canada arm and mission operations from the habitat. Uh, commensurate with our goals, we have a geologist, a pilot who also s doubles as the robotic mission specialist because of dexterity with the control stick, and an engineer who specializes in the drilling operations and the maintenance of the ECLIS systems aboard the ship. Also, using three instead of four allows for a larger sample return using a ride. And the selection of this will not just come from US citizens, but will be representative of our international partners, which will be shown in our later policy sections. Health and safety is incredibly important. If we were to live and truly thrive in a deep space environment, which our habitat aims to show, we need to monitor continuously to meet our life science objectives. There'll be twice daily monitoring with a pulse oximeter, which is a very low invasive test, and we'll basically create a data set of life sciences data which can be compared to low Earth orbit missions. Uh, today, uh, uh, it's Scott Kelly is supposed to launch for his year-long mission to the ISS. We have a lot of information for low Earth orbit, and we can extrapolate to that to some extent to models beyond the Van Allen radiation belts, but it will be essential to actually validate our models and show the differences between deep space and uh, living in a lunar orbit. To maintain health and not just monitor it, we have a cardiovascular and resistive training regimen adapted from the ISS, and there'll be daily private conversations with a flight surgeon to assess the mental and physical health of the astronauts. Uh, yeah, next. EVAs are an incredibly important part of our mission. We have seven plans, and we cannot afford for any margin of error. Uh, this, the uh, asteroid may be unstable. We have no idea what this internal structure is before we go to it. If we start drilling, it may shift, which could change the uh, moments of inertia, the configuration and potentially violently break up the station. And so extreme caution and care must be taken when interacting with the asteroid surface. The robotic arm that we're proposing would allow for a platform for storing uh, tools and also for pushing against drilling. And we've also looked into different techniques for uh, drills that grab on and use the, uh, these basic anchors to push against as you drill. Because of a lot of innovation things that we've used in our design, we decided to stick with uh, heritage proven ISS EVA suits to minimize the risk of all of our technology introduction on a single flight. Uh, also, we are using derived for, in case of the event of a tether break, we're using the SAFER system, which has been designed to provide an extra level of redundancy in, for astronauts and EVA. When we are dealing with this asteroid, we are treating it as if it's a crime zone. Uh, planetary protection is of the utmost importance for our mission. There are three basic goals. We do not want to accidentally or inadvertently contaminate organic material from Earth on this asteroid because that could skew our results in our data of what we're looking for. We do not want to expose the crew to <coughs> potentially harmful regolith or organic materials during the course of the mission, and we certainly do not want to introduce harmful organic materials from the asteroid back to the Earth's ecosystem. To minimize the exposure, we have a number of uh, advanced technologies in place and a strict planetary protection protocol to ensure the isolation of materials at all times. Uh, by, place another, uh, by placing the propulsion module at the rear of the, uh, the configuration, any uh, organic plumes from the impinging thrusters would likely miss the asteroid. We use uh, carefully designed aseptic uh, devices to handle the asteroid, and all samples are placed in hermetically sealed containers, which will not be opened until they are safely stored in glove boxes on Earth. This is to prevent any sort of possible cross-contamination of the samples. So while well, of course we understand that science and uh, design and whatnot are of course very important for the mission, we can't of course forget policy and outreach and keeping everyone happy here on Earth. Um, so for policy purposes, not only did we actually call up and talk to a space lawyer to make sure that our mission design, which focuses on science and international affairs, is compliant with the UN um, space policy. Um, we also did want to make sure that we focus and emphasize the fact that we are trying to design this mission to be similar to an ISS, where it's several countries collaborating, as shown by use of the Canada arm, um, by use of even the Orion capsule with a use of service module. Um, and then in terms of for outreach, of course, we are going to be using social media and reaching out there. We have our Twitter account, as well as, <laughs> that is currently active. 
as well as um, other outlets. One thing that we really wanted to emphasize that we were really excited about for uh, outreach for the humans here on Earth was to kind of recreate that Apollo 11 era excitement for space. And so by doing this, what we're planning on doing is actually installing a 3D HD 360 camera <laughs> onto the helmets of all of our astronauts during the EVAs so that we can actually send back the data real, uh, real time of the actual viewpoint of the astronauts while they're doing these EVAs, which we think will actually kind of really gather the attention of not only the space geeks like ourselves, but <laughs> people outside. Um, and so in the interest of keeping our Twitter active, I hope you all will join me for a selfie. Um, <laughs> 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 Slide. Um, so now we get to our cost of the mission. So we do understand that the actual asteroid redirect robotics mission is estimated to be at about $3 billion. So we, of course, want to, that's for robotics. So we want to actually focus and emphasize and make sure we spend our resources to keep our humans safe. Um, and so by doing this, we can see that not, uh, understandably, the launches are expensive. Uh, we're going to be carrying a whole bunch of stuff. But we also do want to mention that the actual purchase of the Orion itself is not cheap. It's separate from the actual launch cost. Um, and so um, by just combining the two itself, it already um, starts to turn into no longer a pocket change of a mission. <laughs> um, but then we also made sure to include additional propulsion costs, communications costs, and each subsystem prices, um, of which I do want to emphasize. A lot of these, we actually called up companies and um, the of who we were looking at um, communicating with and actually using their products to see what their actual price estimates were for it, um, which was really exciting and cool to experience. <laughs> um, we do want to make sure to mention that we do have risk and mis mitigations. Um, many of us, I'm sure, are familiar with this chart. Uh, green is for safe, red is bad. Um, <laughs> and, um, we understand that being in the five and five means that loss of mission as well as loss of crew, which is something we don't want. So we're very happy to say that we only actually have one that is currently in the red, and it's still of a very low likelihood. Um, and of course, we have done extensive detail into actually mitigating and making sure that none of these risks are going to actually go through. And we actually have a backup slide with um, more detailed information of how we're going to actually go about. We made a failure chart for that, our failure tree, I believe it's called. Um, and then in addition, we want to really emphasize the fact that this is, yes, it's for Mars, of course. We all love Mars. Mars is cool. It's red. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's also the fact that this, this goes beyond. This is for the astronauts in the crowd or astronaut in the crowd. <laughs> this is for the people that may soon be astronauts um, in this crowd. Uh, we want to make sure that they are reliable. They are able to be self-reliant when they're out there. We want to make sure that they are able to be confident in this kind of mission for anything, whether that be deep space, whether that be Mars, whether that be even close at home. Um, in addition to the fact that we want to emphasize the fact that asteroid itself is really exciting. It has a lot of minerals. It had a, has a lot of resources that we can utilize and that we can experiment with and get to um, acknowledge its history and pure uh, I don't know how to express this, my internal excitement. <laughs> <laughs> They're really cool. Um, they have a lot of information that we can get out of them that is really beneficial for both the science as well as other purposes. Um, so in conclusion, we just wanted to end it with a bit of a summary of our mission statements and uh, our, our mission objectives and goals. Once again, reiterating the fact that this is both dependent on our humans as well as our resources and the use of this asteroid. And then, and then, <laughs> yeah. And then finally, uh, we just want to make a good number of acknowledgements, not only to the coordinators and the heads, Nico, Hayden, as well as Jay, we do want to thank Infinity. We want to thank all of the Daves and presenters that came to us, <laughs> <laughs> um, as well as uh, the JPLS A team, JPLSA team, as well as Nigel. A really, a really great psychological help during this time. <laughs> <laughs> um, any 
and then we open this up to questions. aspects to that question. One is uh, asteroids have hit the Earth in the past. It's been a very bad day uh, for dinosaurs. Um, the, uh, the other aspect of that is uh, the cosmic ray kind of expectation value of, of, of penetration is about a meter, and this asteroid will be larger than that, so there is a possibility that stuff inside that could potentially be alive. Now, personally, and I think most of the people in this room would agree with me, the chance of something inside an, astero uh, an asteroid causing a problem is extremely low, uh, but there's no harm in being safe rather than sorry, especially the first time you try, before you have a good look, you know, with your proper isolation and so on. And if you find there's no, nothing there, well, that's, that's a nice answer as well, but you want to be on the safe side for the first mission. <coughs> Tom? Yeah, so there was a statement about uh, using the arm to push when you're drilling, but what does this push against? <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, so you're, uh, basically it's um, the drill itself, So a station keeping a 15 meters per second with a 500 ton rock attached to you, 15 meters per second, how much fuel was that in your calculations? Oh, so that wasn't actually for station keeping in terms of the armor that was connected to the asteroid. That was in terms of for um, trajectory. I believe that was in terms of for trajectory keeping when we're actually on transit over the situation that we had to keep the asteroid. Okay. <laughs> That's yeah. 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 yeah, it's something that's at the ARM stage yeah. with the Gets it in a stable orbit, nothing much we can do to affect that. Okay, here's um, a follow up question. Sure. <laughs> um, but please ask All of your question. diagrams were showing that the asteroid is back. Is back, yes. So it's in their bag. Yes. And, uh, and yet your science is all talking about uh, uh, space environment around the asteroid, which is back. Um, radiation effects. Were you looking for secondary radiation emitting back off the asteroid? Because it strikes me that. Certainly, the bag will be opened at some point. Stuff will come out. It will be in parallel orbits. It may come back. Um, there's, there's all kinds of aspects there. Um, the, the science we developed is actually agnostic with respect to uh, whether option A or option B was selected. Uh, though, given the possibility of a bag, we have to then deal with the bag. Um, would you like to add anything? Monica. Oh, Monica, please. So, um, so we did have a lot of drawing that's based on option A. But, uh, like, uh, so the space environment um, characterization is just that we're planning to putting on. The primary purpose is not um, to characterize the, the first two, at least for the survey. It's not for the actual space environment of the asteroid. It is for um, a pre-check before we deploy EVA or even send people out for like bag cutting, that kind of operation. And another thing is like, uh, why don't we just measure it on our spacecraft? Well, we don't really know what is the situation when you have a bag around the asteroid. Is there any kind of volatile that coming out of, or even though the bag is currently that's perfectly sealed, but you also have other design that have like different kind of rips uh, around it. 
So the, the primary uh, plasma, uh, sorry, space environment to, in the beginning is for, uh, again, pre-surface pre check whether we can deploy EVA, is it safe for the robotics to go ahead and do uh, the back cutting operation. And then after that, we will, um, for the auction A, we'll cut over the back, cut open the back, and then we'll deploy the actual space environment monitoring to do for science purposes. Great response. Thank you.
make their own choice and carry it out successfully, that would be our gating function for, okay, it looks like there aren't any strange cognitive things that are happening to the astro astronauts out at this location. We're going to allow them to go ahead and try this slightly more challenging, slightly more independent um, path. Um, so that would be our sort of end goal uh, as far as uh, expanding sort of the human horizon um, with some of these capabilities and using the time for not just science, uh, material science, but kind of the and geology that we're all excited about, but um, moving us forward. As for the second part of your question about actual emergencies during the EVA, I'm not the one to answer that. <laughs> uh, Mark, do you want to ask anything? Yeah, so I just want to add on that. Um,
looked like the um, the arrays that were on ARM that you guys were proud of have fifty kilowatts available to you, um, uh, and the R arrays that were on your Habitat module were the same size. So okay. are are they are they, are you bringing up fifty kilowatts on the um, on the vehicle that's coming up with <coughs> yeah. the Labitat as well? So you'll have a hundred. That's that's correct. Um, it's part of uh, the the ARM module will be out there quite some time, and we expect some degradation. Uh, and in order to ensure that we had enough power for all the operations we anticipated, and also for legacy operations, uh, you know, the robotic payloads can continue, can continue operating there indefinitely uh, to bring, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not a huge uh, marginal increase in weight to strap it onto the side of the, of the lab attack, and then you've got that power available for you. Um, we haven't touched the market yet. Yeah, so uh, there's a slight difference in size. So the ones that were proposed as part of the, the kit study on the feasibility of this mission for ARM were uh, 10.7 meter diameter. Uh, the ones that uh, uh, CAD were slightly different, they're 9.5 meters. That was to achieve about 25 kilowatts of uh, generation for the total mission lifetime with a 25% by the margin in there. So that makes the habitat fully sufficient for science operations on its own, which is especially important when it's doing that 100 day transit on its own without any other uh, power provided by ARM. So uh, it makes the habitat fully self sufficient for that, and then it just, it's a, it's a great power uh, boost when they're working together. We have about, um, we have about uh, 65 kilowatts of available power for the total mission duration, and only uh, 45 kilowatts of power allocated by all of our subsequent needs. Great, thank you very much. So we're actually, <coughs> excuse me, we're actually out of time for uh, questions. Uh, so why don't we have? Well, the other team got one. So I already gave you guys two extra minutes to <laughs> match up with the other team's two extra minutes. So uh, why don't we get Chief Voyager to come up and uh, we can come around with a talk.